Before we get started, I just wanted to say that we love hearing from everyone who listens to this show. We want to continue to improve the show, but we don't want to litter it with advertisements for beds. So instead, we're doing a Patreon campaign called Toast Your Host, and it goes like this. If you'd raise your drink to show your podcast host some love and buy one of us a glass of libation, then it'll not only fight a parched throat, but also help us buy the equipment to make the show even better. All you have to do is just go to patreon.com forward slash get to the good part. No spaces. And pick the drink that you'd like to toast. But if a monthly toast isn't in your budget, and we totally get that, then please go to iTunes and rate us. I know iTunes is a pain in the butt to rate podcasts, but it's worth a round of drinks to us. And now let's get to the good part. Welcome to Get to the Good Part, folks. My name is Ryan. This is Chris. And I'm Aaron. And we are fresh off of a weekend with the man himself, Ernest Klein. That's right. We went up to Columbus and uh, we were there for the book signing. Didn't know about the book signing in Ashland. Otherwise, I probably would have parlayed that into a second night of frivolity and fun. Wait, but was a book signing I gotta in tell Ashland? you, man. It, in, in Ashland. Ashland? Where the fuck's Ashland? That's where That's he where from. Where, where he grew up. Oh, I see. So we would have followed him to his hometown. Right. <laughs> right. It was the, <laughs> not stalkery at all. The thing was, nope. is like I I had to stick around for work the next day. Oh. I ended up I ended up not getting home until like 9 p.m. the following day because I had to stay there and work. So I might as well have just stayed and gone to Ashland. But honestly, if that night could have drug on for a week, I totally would have let it. Uh, it was so cool. We met uh, a few people from, uh, you know, from, you know, a few of our listeners and things like that. Uh, we got to meet the man himself. We met Ernie, Ernie Klein. It was fucking awesome. I mean, this was Columbus is a great city. Highlight, you know, highlight experiences, man. Like the highlight reel of my life will include that weekend for sure. Yeah. Uh, uh, Columbus is a fucking awesome city. It's huge for one. It has a ton of like little towns off off of it. Suburb kind of towns. Um, they have several sensory deprivation spas uh, to choose from, which I found to be pleasant. And, and they have an arcade bar with a pizza joint right across the street. Fucking that and a was... great pizza bar. Like that yeah, was awesome. fucking awesome pizza. I'm going to throw in a plug here. Uh, Old North Arcade in Columbus is probably one of the best barcades I've ever been to. Holy as shit. long as you're drinking at this bar. They will allow you to play games for free. You don't have yeah, to drop I, a single quarter. I just sipped the shit out of mine for <laughs> like two hours. Uh, it was yeah, a great Chris, time. Chris and... left at a uh, very humble time. I think you were gone by like 10 p.m. No, I left at midnight. Oh, was it, it midnight? It was fucking midnight. Like, I thought I was like being old. Like, sorry, guys, I got to cut out because, you know, 43. I felt and... bad because I, I, I shut the place down, man. I what? stayed until closing playing joust. <laughs> Is that where like they come up to you and like the mach- they're starting to turn the machines off and looking at you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've still got a fucking beer. Leave me alone. Yeah. <laughs> it was yeah, it was a, like I, I I didn't want the night to end, man. I was I was I was fully in it. I loved it. It was right. so much fun. Uh, we do want to go over uh because this is kind of a thin chapter, chapter twenty one. We won't get into it right off the bat, but there were, it's, it, it, it's a thin chapter, probably to say the least, but, uh, but we do want to talk a little bit about our experience in Columbus because it was really fucking awesome. Um, first of all, Ernest Klein's plane was delayed, um, and he didn't get there until a little bit later than he thought he was going to, but he ran right up on the stage. I made a post on the subreddit about this, so if this is redundant to anybody, I'm sorry. But, you know, to you and the listener audience, if you didn't read the subreddit, then uh, you'll like this story. Uh, right in front of us, in line, uh, was a guy named Ken with his stepson. They took a 16-hour bus ride. That's one way. Not 16 hours round trip. That's 16 hours one way. Oh, my fucking God. I, and no, he I'm not posted that about dedicated. It on, he posted about it on Twitter. And when we, uh, like I said, he was right in front of us in line to get our book signed. When he walked up there, Ernest Klein recognized him from the Twitter post. <laughs> 
And he said, the entire time that my plane was delayed, I was thinking about you guys, the guys that rode 16 hours on the, on the bus. And he was like, I could not let you down. <laughs> but, you know, one way or another, he got here, you know, despite the, the plane delay and everything. But it's just so cool to see, you know, a guy who's creating on the level of Ernest Klein. He's got a movie coming out in like less than a month. That's directed by Steven Spielberg, and still you're checking Twitter and you're seeing these two huge fans, and you're recognizing them and you're thinking about them when you're stuck at the airport. It felt completely genuine. I mean, this guy, just like I like I said on Reddit, you know, uh, you know, I didn't think I could be a bigger fan of him, but here we are. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, I, I was really kind of nervous because you never know. If the people that you put on a pedestal, once you actually get close to them, turn out to be, turn out to live up to the pedestal you've put them on. You know, you kind of gild that fucking pedestal. So you, you really hope that they are kind, that they're gracious, that they're funny or, or interesting to listen to. Or just that they're not an asshole. That's it. Right. They're, they're, they're not a fucking asshole. I mean, he was just, he was the every man's geek is really what it came down to. The every man's nerd. And he was so happy, and you could tell that he was a fan uh, of people who were fans of the stuff that he liked. The, his, his book is like this weird obsession, or uh, I said obsession, a weird inception of fans digging into the shit that he has been a fan of for so long and being a fan of his fandom. And he seems to really appreciate that. Like, like he knows it. So when he's talking to about talking to Spielberg, how he's like geeking out and is just this, this huge fan of all these people that he now has come into contact with. He had pictures of him with Nathan Fillion and uh, who's the dude's name is uh, last name is Green. He does robot Seth, Green. Seth, Seth Green. Green and just meeting all of these people that he's already been a fan of for so long. And then to have people there and him really embrace them <clears throat> as one of his own. I mean, it was really like a, a thousand people packed into this room that was equivocally one tribe. And it was sort of a one-night-only event. I mean, it really felt like the people that we've connected with, I mean, we came into the community admittedly late. I mean, we, we just started the podcast last year, and we stumbled into an already established Ready Player One community. And the people who were already established in that community really welcomed us with open arms. It was fucking phenomenal. I mean, Angie Ray was there. Um, the guy that goes by Anorak, the cosplayer. This oh, guy is so probably cool. one of the coolest people <laughs> totally. I've met. Um, TR Wookie out there in Columbus. Uh, it was so cool to hang out with you, man. Um <clears throat> God, I'm 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 gonna forget names, but all I'm the people that met names. us up and what's that? I said I'm horrible with names, but I remember all their faces. It, yeah. it felt like we were surrounded by people that knew us for one, and that I just loved getting to know. Yeah, I mean there were there were a few people, and we were so fortunate. It was like people came up and they knew the podcast, and you know they 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 started talking to us. And, you know, some of them came back to the to the to the arcade after the signing and everything like that. It was just it was so cool to sit down and talk to people about Ready Player One. I mean, that's the reason we started the podcast to begin with. We, you know, we talked about it amongst ourselves. We probably thought about it. I know I did. I thought about it a lot before uh, we started, you know, we started doing it. It's just so cool that there's this whole community out there. And they're active right now. I mean, as we record this, the world premiere is happening in Austin, Texas. Uh, and people just falling in love with the book. And, and by the way, that you know, one of the things we took away from Columbus is uh Ernest it, it's out now, but it was sort of like, you know, early news. Um the 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 book by March 1st, when Ernest was there, it was it, it had hit number one on the New York Times bestseller list again. Holy shit, again. Holy shit. Yeah, <clears throat> it's number one on New York Times bestseller list right now. It's like, which is just fucking phenomenal, which means that they, it's it's creating a whole new wave of fans yeah. that didn't read it the first time through. So 
Shame it's on just that for not reading it the to, first like, time. To, to come into this community <laughs> and find out that there's... Because it really, and I said this when we started the podcast, you know, I mean, the reason we started the podcast is because the first time you read it, you, you just want more of it. And where do you go for that? You go to the community and it's just, it's insane, the community around this book. They're so gracious. They're so awesome. Um, I mean, it was like, it was like meat and family. It was crazy. Uh, Without it, all the fights. Yeah, no, <laughs> it, it was great to, to sit amongst all the fans of the book and then they find out that we're on the podcast and like, oh yeah, that's great. You know, I remember listening to the last episode and I, you know, listen and, and your thoughts on that particular part were great and awesome. I feel, this is how I feel. Like that was just so much fun to just talk with all these other Uber fans. And, you know, like we should have just brought a microphone and started recording again because it was, you know, with the, the additional insights from these other people, it, it was a great time. Like I, like, like you, I wish we could go back and just extend the trip even more. Yeah. Well, let's go over. Okay. So, so Ernest Klein, I, I want to give everybody who didn't have the opportunity to go. And if you didn't, I'm really sorry about that. Uh, but we're going to go back through and we're going to give you kind of a blow by blow just so that you can kind of feel like you were there. Um, so we got there pretty early. It was five 30 or I think 4.30 when we got there. It was freezing fucking cold. Um, we kind of grouped up in the line before we went into the signing. Uh, we went, the, the, Fortunately, the venue was very gracious. They opened up the doors because it was freezing oh, outside. God. It was literally yeah. freezing. Like, like that, that spell of cold was coming down. That Arctic blast was looping. In one day, it went from something like 60 degrees to 30. But, yeah. But, by the end of the event, it was fucking snowing. Yeah, it was snowing outside. And uh, and yeah, so like we, we, we stood inside for a while. We got in a couple hours before the event started, which was great because uh, we were able to like, you know, kind of we got first row. Uh, we got to group up with all the people that, you know, we had talked to on Twitter, on the subreddit, on Facebook, everything like that. Um, we got to walk around and talk to people. And uh, it, it was really great. And then, you know, like I said before, Ernest Klein, his plane was delayed in Atlanta when he was on his way there. And uh, and yeah, so he came in a little bit late. But there was this guy that reached out to us on the uh, subreddit. And his 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 handle on the subreddit, I won't give it up because it was a it was a longer one, but it was funny. But this kid came out there and. I'm, I'm going to guess your age. Of, it's it still, Yes. Like maybe first year of college. This very young kid came out there and he was, the, he was the one that had to come out and say, Hey, uh, Ernest is playing delayed. Um, so he just shot off trivia off the top of his head. This kid, it was fantastic. He, he was just like firing out trivia to try and like, you know, buy time. But he was, he was hilarious too. Because everybody, everybody was kind of firing off the answers, you know, before he could even finish questions. And at one point he was like, <laughs> he was saying, you guys can at least pretend to be stumped. <laughs> oh, oh, I know who you're talking about. I'm sorry, I was thinking about the kid outside while we were waiting. No. I was still reminiscing about how freaking frigid it was. But uh, yeah, the dude no, who the was guy, The guy who right. was uh, buying time for Ernest mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, before, before the thing started. I mean, he was... He was fantastic. Oh, he was awesome. He really was. Yeah, he was, was really great. Yeah. So whatever your name is, man, if you if you, if you've happened to pick up on the podcast since then, thank you so much because it was it was really cool that you you got up there and did it. But you know, after a little while, Ernest Klein, the man himself, he took the stage, and when he did, he was full of energy. And if any of you have ever had a delayed flight in your life, you know that is a feat fit for a god. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because I have no energy left after a delayed flight. I just want to get home and say, fuck the world, go to sleep. <laughs> I'm done. But was, he got up there. I mean, like, he just snapped up there and he started talking about He He did the, his whole presentation, which we learned in line from people who had talked to him or been to, you know, previous book signings. He has this dedicated Macintosh computer. I said Macintosh like it's the olden times, but he has this dedicated computer that just has his his uh setup on it 
that he sends ahead of himself so that they can set up, you know, the the presentation and everything. And uh, so he gave this this probably hour long presentation about him growing up in Ohio. I mean, what did you guys glean from that? What were your takeaways? Do you find anything particularly interesting? Well, he was just as goofy looking as a kid as the rest of us were. Yeah. <laughs> he looked like my son, frankly. You know, I, I saw I saw success in my child <laughs> by gauging his current success with his younger self. <clears throat> so, I, you know, the, the glasses and the, the big smile that just sort of permeated through. And it, I had expected a 15-minute talk. So when I when you read the 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 bit about the entire event, it kind of glosses through. He'll talk for fifteen minutes, then he'll do signing, and bada bing, you're done. But he talked for like an hour. Yeah. It's a slideshow. It wasn't like PowerPoint, you know, point by point kind of things. It was just pictures, and then he would talk about the pictures, and he really just moved from how he was young, or and then how he got kind of inspired up through. The loss of his mother and how that inspired uh, fanboys and how that was such a miserable experience. And I, I kind of liked how it also brushed on the fact that he had to deal with a a couple of producers that are not quite in a positive light socially anymore. <laughs> uh, and then how that kind of evolved into where he is today. Kind of like fanboys was a horrible uh, stepping stone to have to experience. But after that, he said it got him into the Writers Guild, and that's how he was able to sell the script before the book even hit the market, and then it just kind of blossomed from there. So if anything, my takeaway was, if I produce something and then end up having just a horrible experience, just to freaking persevere, because sometimes those first steps are meant to be torturous, almost like a rite of passage. Like you can't forget the the Ohio DeLorean Club. Oh yeah, you know, fucking cool. That the was Ghostbusters and the minivan. Or the Ghostbusters, yeah. Jesus Christ, that was awesome. That was so cool when the three uh, DeLoreans rolled in. Like we were freezing our asses off, and that was just about what everybody needed to, you know, to see those was awesome. Yeah, I just I never realized that because oftentimes when you see movies, the sound effects are added in. And when I heard the DeLoreans drive up, they've just got this weird space age grumble. That There's like just that throaty sound to it. That, that, it's just, it's yeah. just this weird alien purr to, to the engine. I was like, I, I honestly thought that when I had seen this vehicle in movies that they had added weird sound effects, but that's how the freaking car sounds. That's the mm -hmm. Renault engine in it. That, that sounds like that. They do nothing to tamper that down. It's just, it was just super cool. So to see three or four of them roll up uh, was just super spectacular. It was just really neat. And you get to talk to the peeps that have uh, gone through and, and refurbished them and brought them back into their into their glory day splendor. It's just just unique. Super cool. Yeah. Talk about dedication. Like I just can't imagine you know, the investment that they've made to bring these cars back to life. And... That, you know, like I think they all had flux capacitors in them. At least one of them did. At least one of them did, um, and I'm sure there are other mods that you know some of them did to get it a little bit more like the the movie prop. But oh, it's just so cool to like st stand next to one, look at it real close. Yeah, it was great. I'm going to be honest, and I was telling Aaron about this before we hit record tonight. I've actually started to price out. DeLoreans. Dude, I was I was at the website for GMC looking for the the new DeLorean website that they've got both for buying and selling older yeah. versions and potentially making new ones because it looks like you can fill out a form to show interest and they get back to you to tell you what the price is. Right. And then I looked at the price ranges. And something like between 30 and $60,000 for a used DeLorean is Okay, way, so what I outside. found I found them online for nineteen between nineteen and thirty-five. Wow. Okay. Cool. Yeah. And I'm, I'm like right now I'm probably sixty percent certain that there's a DeLorean in my future. 
<laughs> I'm dead serious. It, it is a pretty fucking cool car. This, uh, you is, know, it's... this is my new North Star. <laughs> like, I will own a fucking DeLorean before I die, so it'll be gone. <laughs> This is the car that that cocaine in the eighties brought to <laughs> brought to fruition. <laughs> I mean, there's it, this, this is car, a cocaine fever dream of a car. <laughs> it, 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 literally, literally, it, it literally. That's why they went out of business, right? Like the car supposedly had like areas sort of baked in where you could hide drugs. Yeah, if that, Scarface, if Scarface <laughs> made a car, it would this be the car, DeLorean. <laughs> Could not be any more 80s, both in its reason for existing and how we know it today. <laughs> it, it speaks of 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 cocaine induced 80s, just you know, uh, uh, glamour, pop and glamour. I'm now on I'm now on a DMC website right now, looking at these things. Like they got some of the the listing of the used uh, DeLoreans. Mm-hmm. I should stop looking at it. Yeah. The greatest thing, the greatest thing is like when you go up to some of them, it'll be like includes flux capacitor, <laughs> which you know is just like a little LED rig in between the seats. But it's just like I love shopping for a car, and it's like does it does it include the flux, or do I have to install that myself? I'd like it to be automatic air conditioning. I like power <laughs> windows, but if I had to sacrifice any of those. It would absolutely have to have a flux capacitor. I don't care yeah. if it's got air conditioning. <laughs> yeah. It how, much be... would it, how much would it cost to install my flux capacitor? Well, you don't need the, you don't need the air conditioner because you're never going to drive it. You're just going to rub it with a diaper. Nope. <laughs> fuck that. No, no, no. <laughs> no, you're definitely driving that shit. You want to be oh, the that's end of the Day Off reference right there. <laughs> All right. Well, if you're not a car fan, you're hating this conversation right now. <laughs> We're going to move on to the chapter here. Hey, you know what, though? If you're not a car fan and you're listening to this podcast, you're still a fan of a DeLorean. Oh, yeah. Yeah, without question. Oh, yeah. I'm not a car fan. I love a DeLorean. I'm not either. I could care less about cars, but the DeLorean has a special place in my heart. So today on Get to the Good Part, we are on chapter 21, a chapter that begins in regret. <laughs> the ultimate is regret. It, is it because of the Uber Betty? It's because of the pining. Oh. And uh. the uh, the lack of focus on Wade's part. Uh he has he has watched this ship sail past him. Um we'll get into a little bit uh how he kind of sort of <laughs> lays the blame on Artemis. <laughs> Which I think is sort of unfounded, but <laughs> but yeah, I mean it, it it kicks up with Wade realizing that he's wasted a lot of his time over the past few months. Took a while. Um, but it also begins with Bindoro's tablet of finding. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> now Findoro's tablet of finding. I looked this up. Findoro is not a reference to really anything. This is something that's fresh off the top of his head. That's the same conclusion I came to because, uh, man, I I tried all kinds of searches and I couldn't find any other reference to Findoro other than people who created used it used it in part of their username on some form or whatever. Well, it's definitely original. It. He gave he he gave somebody the uh, permission to use it in a video game. I can't remember the name of it. I didn't write it down. I apologize. But uh, Ernest Klein actually gave permission to use Fendora's Tablet of Finding in another video game because they were a fan of Ready Player One, which is, you know, fucking awesome. But um, it's basically just a flat black circle. Um, And when you enter a name onto it, it will tell you where that person is located within the Oasis. Now, in the context of the hunt, this is an extremely valuable artifact. Um, let's get into artifacts and what they are, right? Right. Yep. Yeah, we need to get that out of the way. Okay. So um, an artifact is something that... It, now, we're getting into nerd minutia here, so welcome to the party. But um, there's a thing in video games 
that is re- referenced almost <laughs> as a deity uh, that's known as RNG. <laughs> and that is the random number generator. <laughs> RNG is your likelihood of picking up a rare item in a video game. And they refer to it as RNG. You know, RNG will allow you to find something or not. (laughs) And uh, that's basically how these artifacts happen. Only, you know, if you're looking, you know, you can base this off of your experience in World of Warcraft. I know I can base it off my experience in, uh, in Destiny. RNG is basically referred to as a god in that game. Um, you never know what you're going to get. And, you know, life is like that box of chocolates. And, uh, and yeah, but, but, but RNG kind of dictates when these artifacts fall. But the thing is, is that they're all unique. So the RNG on a, on an artifact is extremely low. And what I mean by it's extremely low is the odds of you picking one of these things up is almost like at a lottery level is that the same read you guys got uh it sounded like particularly for these items since they are wholly unique that the book goes into detail about how there's only one it's not even a matter of you could do the same thing over and over and over and potentially get another but that there is something that you end up doing that's incredibly difficult you end up beating this godlike boss and then you might you might get one this one thing, and that that one thing just pops out ever so every so often. And okay, in, so, in this case, just once. So we've encar- we've encountered one more artifact in the book at this point. Do you remember what it was? The, 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 the beta capsule. Beta capsule, right? Beta capsule, right? Right. So were they the only ones to get a beta capsule, or did anybody who finished that quest get a beta capsule? It didn't uh, say. Yeah, see, that's one of those things that I had in my notes on that chapter was, you know, they, somebody took the time to make this quest and they have this rare artifact as the reward, potentially as the reward for it. And they said it was well hidden. So like, you spend all this time making this quest that takes a week, 16 hours a day to make, and you go ahead and you hide it. That's like, that's crazy. Especially if there's only one artifact you can get from it. I mean, there, there really isn't anything else from the show other than like winning like a, a kaiju, you know, skin or something like that. Or pet. Kaiju pet would be awesome. Yeah. But still, you know, I mean, an artifact, and it is, is referred to as an artifact, right? Right. Yes. The beta capsule. So what they say is they are one of a kind. And... You get it, you know, randomly off of a boss. The system generates your your artifact, right? So I thought that was really interesting, and I'm gonna we'll pick this apart in uh, two separate sections here. So first of all, the system generates an artifact. So this goes back to the whole AI kind of thing, right? Like, does it know? Or is it is it programmed into? the quest to say one person, one lucky fucking person is going to get this one artifact or does the system say based on the criteria that you put in here, I'm going to automatically load this artifact into the experience for one person. It, what that's meant to do is it's meant to really challenge and drag through high level characters through a, uh... Uh, sort of an elite challenge and to give them something potentially at the end of that road to strive for. Right. Uh, and that's that's the whole purpose of it. And it, this chapter actually nails down the fact that there's a whole auctioning system, a, an Oasis eBay of sorts, I'd imagine, where you can trade and auction off these items. So this seems to be a common system for, for the larger part of the Oasis. Uh, I think I think this one had to have been baked into the quest as opposed to just being a random generation. It's too specific to not be. But yeah, and that's the whole point of having a really challenging quest is that you've got something that's related to the quest at the end of the road. Could you imagine being the second person to try that quest and spend the whole week doing it and not get what you think is supposed to be a rare right. artifact? 
It's yeah. like a one in a billion kind of thing that you're going to get that that drop. Well, and I think they mentioned it. it's hidden and it's incredibly difficult, incredibly time consuming. That really narrows down who is going to be able to get to it, even if even if the first person who does it gets it. So, so yeah, I think these are things that are baked into these missions. Yeah, so I think the only way that it's plausible that they were able to do this quest and get the beta capsule at this point was that it had to have been a quest that wasn't in the Oasis until after the hunt or even after the first key was found. Here's something that that I think is kind of unusual because what you have is a lot of different businesses and designers within the Oasis that are creating these worlds and they're creating the equipment that ends up being sold. And they're creating the missions on these worlds that people can go through. I gotta imagine that's something that's third party managed. If any third party could come up with this godlike power to throw at the end of their quest, wouldn't there be more? It feels like there would have to be some sort of vetting process for somebody to submit these sorts of all powerful items within these quests. Well, Not to presumably get to the... it's all GSS, right? They're I don't the one think that... so. You've got multiple companies creating these worlds and these themes. I don't think so GSS you're saying is designing that, everything. Like, the third-party quests that get loaded into the Oasis, there has to be some sort of approval process for the artifacts because they are so powerful so, and they, they, they impact the game. It's like the app store. Way. Apple has to approve every app. <laughs> Maybe they have to approve every artifact. Yes, we're getting into the part of my job that I don't like, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but still, they say you have, to, you have to defeat a godlike villain. That's your most... And this is, this is the part where I would say Ernest Klein is so connected to the fan community. Is, you know, he, he doesn't really give you a specific path to how to obtain an artifact. The only real guaranteed way is to do it through, like Chris said, the auctions. But outside of that, you can you can kill a godlike boss, and you have a chance at at having one of these artifacts drop. That's what RNG is. I mean, it, you you never know when you know your egg or your fucking thing is gonna drop. It's it's completely random. Well, I think in this situation, some of these aren't random. Like it's but, if you accomplish but there's only it, one. you get it. So are you the first one to beat it, and you get that thing? It seems like it. Okay. At uh, least but, per, per the description, yeah, kind of. But he never, well, he never says that, though, that they're the first ones to beat it. In this case, the implication is that they're the first ones to do that quest. Yeah. That it's Where hidden. did they say that? It's difficult. Well, it, it, I think it's kind of like it's layered in there because it's well hidden and right. it hasn't been around that long. And th I think that's the, the conclusion that you come to. They never say that they were the first ones to beat it. No. They, they never say that, so... Were they and the first the, or the, the second only thing or the we 15th? have to go off of is his description of how to obtain an artifact in the wild, which sounds to me like RNG. I mean, yeah. to assume that this quest is out there and he is the only one to have beaten it up to that point, I mean, sure, it's plausible. He's the only one to find a key at that point or to, or not the only one, but the first one. So it's plausible that, you know, the members of the High Five would be the first one to complete the quest, but he doesn't explicitly say that. No, but he, but he does get into, you know, rather explicitly how difficult it would have been. Sure. Well, it, it has to be a situation where you're the first one to get it, because it very explicitly says that every artifact is unique, meaning that the on, there's only one copy of it that exists in the entire simulation. Right. And you could go through, like, an entire mission and not get a drop or that the drop would happen like once every million times somebody does it. And if you play it's... games, you know that that is just part of fucking life. <laughs> well, that can happen, but there are some games where if you accomplish the mission, you are guaranteed to get that thing. Like that's and the it's... reward for doing it. But it's not a one of a kind thing. And an artifact is. That's true. So yes, I think to answer your question here, because an artifact is only a one time gig that if you do a mission and you get it, you're the one that's got it. That's it. Right, which is why I think it's RNG-based and not first completion. 
Oh, I'm sorry. I was saying that it was first completion and that if you could first one to get it, you get it. Right. I, I honestly think it's RNG based. Like at no point does he imply that they are the first ones to do it. Ah. And if you can point out where he yeah. did say that, I would love to hear it, but I no, don't, you, you're I, correct. does not imply that. Two, two chapters ago, he, he does imply that there was a hidden path within one of the missions that he had uncovered and thus went to Daito and Shoto in order to get with them to try to accomplish that. So it was implied that it was something that no one had done before and that they had kind of sussed out and uncovered and that the end result was something that, that he was anticipating. So I'd say if it wasn't directly said, it was definitely implied in chapter 20. 20, I think, yeah. Well, if you're a listener, you're probably just as frustrated as us in this conversation. You have your opinion, and we want to hear it. So weigh in on the Twits, the subreddit, the Facebook, uh, wherever you go that you feel most comfortable. Let us know what you think. Yep. Well, that was a good uh, retrospective back to chapter 20. Yeah. Oh yeah, totally. I mean, and all yeah. kinds of reps because I'm not I'm not a huge fan of I'm not a huge fan of these artifacts. Why not? Yeah, why not? Tell us. What? Let me I sit on the couch. So why? glad you asked. Why, Chris? <laughs> what? And, and the reason why is because, you know, these are these are god items. These whenever you introduce something that is so above and beyond it's it's like introducing magic or the hand of god if you will at the whim of a controller into a storyline in order to make the storyline work and that's a problem because when you start to introduce that in you start to come to like what well couldn't this have been used differently and i'll give you an example the cataclyst in this chapter we round up the curve to realize that the cataclyst and this tablet of Findoro, Findoro's tablet, are owned by IOI. And that they could have easily sussed out where Parzival lives, and they could have easily just blown up the whole damn sector and killed him and wiped his shit out of the game. They could have removed him from the game, or they could have done it while he was at the globe and knocked out all the best people because it very specifically says, there is no protecting you. Everyone dies, NPC and player alike. Everyone's gone in a given sector. The Cataclysm is a one-time only gig. Yeah, yeah. You'd have to hang on to it. But, but just like uh, in video games, artifacts or, you know, really good shit, it, it has like an immense upside with like this smaller downside that could really affect the gameplay. I mean, it, it all goes down to the same... Uh, t um, description that Parzival gives about why they didn't use Fendoro's tablet of finding to just hunt them down. Because if that moment came where somebody's name showed up on the scoreboard and oh, you've already used it that day, it's now useless. So well, they're yeah, keeping exactly. it, it, it. It's gonna. That's gonna be something that they're just gonna keep in their back pocket until they really, really, really need to use it. Right. And Findora is a little bit different from the Cataclyst because Findora you can only use once a day. The Cataclyst you can only use once in a lifetime. But they wouldn't have even needed to use Findora for the, the globe. They could have just dropped the Cataclyst and said, well, we just wiped out all of the best Gunters, period. We have eliminated, nearly eliminated the competition. But if you needed them to find the first gate or the first key, you're going to need them to find the other couple because you've got an entire army of fucking people. And then you've got the five probably sharpest gunters in the room. You're going to, you're not going to kill them off and then say, okay, well, hopefully we can find it. But they've already tried. What do you mean? I mean, they've, well, they just, they tried to kill, they tried to get Par tried to kill Parzival. It wasn't even a matter of, well, we're not going to pay him. We're just going to let him loose and follow him. They tried to kill him. That's one out of five, though. Well, true. That's one out of five. But then we get into kind of like the tactical decision making. And then you could have thought, well, if they're going to use the same tactical decision making to leave them alive at the distracted globe when they have this weapon in their hands, 
then why would they have even tried to kill Parzival to begin with? So it's a flippant logic. It's either you kill them or you don't kill them. You're either wiping well, out the competition or you're following them. I mean, but, I, I think taking it to distracted globe is bringing a nuke to a gunfight. <laughs> well, I, I think not using it at the distracted globe shows their complete lack of confidence in their ability to find it on their own. Mm-hmm. But they sent people in to kill them. I, yeah, so, like they could have. They could have. But even that's not a bomb. guarantee. The cataclysm would be a guarantee. Not to yeah. mention, you'd probably end up killing Og because it was his his place. Well, I'd say that Og's probably exempt well, from that. Og's well, he, he probably is, but could you imagine how pissed he would be? Very. So pissed. what? <laughs> there are once they own the oasis. Who cares? Uh, you know, they could basically. You know, take Og's powers away from him if they wanted to. But that's artifacts, and uh, <laughs> it's a sticking point. You can tell when you're amongst friends when you can argue about the nature <laughs> of artifacts. <laughs> 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 but regardless of the nature of other artifacts, the only one we're really concerned about this time is uh, Findoro's Tablet of Finding. And uh, it's really interesting the way this thing works. You write the name of the avatar you want to find, which clearly works out to your advantage if you're uh, following people on the hunt. Um, if they're in the same sector, or uh, actually, if you're in a different sector, it'll tell the sector that the person's in. Um, if you're in the same sector as that person, it'll tell what planet they're on. And if you're on the same planet, it'll give you their exact location, which is a huge advantage. But again, you got to be there. You gotta be. It's a pretty fucking random piece of chance that you're going to be in that position. I'd um, say the fact that you've got 18 potential sectors, that even if you're not in the same sector, to narrow it down to one really helps to eliminate other possibilities and might even make the clues pop out more glaring. Sure. 27 sectors? Three times three times three. Yeah, it's 27. My bad. Math. Ha! Hey oh. <laughs> got a Scratch question that. for the program. Three times <laughs> three times yes, my bad. Three times nine is twenty-seven. Uh, and this is why I wasn't good at math. This is why I'm a software engineer, folks. Oh great. <laughs> I must have missed a decimal point. I always do that. So I want to clear something up here just uh for the for the novices like myself, Chris. Um so IOI is the biggest ISP. In the world at this point, right? Yes. Well, so, yeah. I mean, later on, we become more cautious of that. Um, I think Wade is probably pretty cautious of that right now. But, I mean... Doesn't want the man Pandora's listening in. tablet of finding, I mean, they pretty much have that by being by controlling, like, the largest ISP in the world, right? I mean, if they, they wanted to find where, where, where a tune was at any good, you know, any given time, they could look up their IP address, right? I, I think the problem is connecting the avatar with the actual person on the IP. And then on top of that, IPs can be randomly assigned. You okay. connect, you might not always have the same IP. I mean, with some carriers, you're going to get the same IP quite frequently uh, or for an extended period of time, but it, it just it, it's connecting one thing to another, and that might be the challenge. But so, could you not locate them within you know, a certain area? Uh, uh, well, if you're paying for it, then you know what, you know that they're paying for it. But he has a different identity, too. So again, right. it's connecting. And, and on top of that, um, he's in Columbus now in the storyline. Mm-hmm. And I'm not sure if we've gone to that place where his connection to the Oasis is independent. No, from, yeah, from no, the that's ISP. we we have gotten there because that was the selling point, the primary selling point of uh, wherever he is, uh, right? The, the his efficiency apartment. So no, finding him via ISP wouldn't work because he's not actually on. He's not doing business with IOI for for that for that service. Okay, that was just something that popped into my mind. Like I, I, I mean, from from the description of the book, you know, uh. IOI pretty much owns, you know, 90% or something like that. I mean, it's pretty hard to find a place or there are designated places that are outside of IOI's purview. But, you know, could you 
you know, could you rake that system and find that one user and then narrow them down to a location? That was, you know, that, that the first thing, and like I said, I don't work in this shit, so I don't know. But the first thing that came to my mind was with Findora, it was just like, if you guys have, you know, pretty much almost an exclusive access to the Oasis, could you not pinpoint that person otherwise? But I guess... I... If, it, if you don't know who their avatar is, then there's no way to work it backwards. Right. Plus, it might technically be illegal to do that. I don't think they're really worried tech- about what's illegal and what's not here. <laughs> I'm sure they're not, but... It, it might be technically illegal to blow up the stack. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they don't have to leave a uh, digital paper about trail while doing now, that. Like that matters. So long as there isn't... Yeah, so long as there's not a paper trail saying, go find this one guy, it might be illegal to bribe school uh, principals. To get identities. Eh. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, regardless of whether or not it's uh, on the right side of the law, the Sixers are now converging on Sector 7, which is where uh, when they activated Fendura's Tablet of Finding, they found Artemis finding the Jade Key. Um, so did anybody find any significance in Sector 7? I, was just I did not, and I looked. Do you find something? Well, in 2011, there was a movie called Sector 7 that, that South Korea put out. Uh, I That seems a little too, but it was published no. in 2011. So. so the one that I found that was probably would have been the nod that Ernest Klein would have been going for was from Transformers. I'm just seeing that now. The Sector 7 is that, uh, that government <laughs> agency that deals with uh, alien technology and alien threats. Interesting. Hmm. I'm just seeing that now. That's kind of maybe. I could see that. It's kind of like everybody converging on the same sector. Alien it's, threats. It's, uh, it's it's 80s for sure, uh, and it's it's a uh, sort of baked in. Yeah, I could totally see that. Well, regardless, I I do want to point this out because um, this is some this is sort of a <laughs> checkpoint we've touched on throughout the book um right now uh we we have confirmation of the fact that uh artemis is the first person to find out or to solve both clues while wade is the first one to get the key by you know beating joust or beating the lich king at joust uh artemis is still the first one to figure out both clues you know, so I was she's thinking two about, out of three so yeah. far. I, I was thinking about that this evening, and I might have to recant the the Parzival being the better player here. But because... certainly at this point, she's number one. She's the smarter one. Absolutely. You know, she For didn't sure. just get she she got to both of them first. She conquered both of them on her own, even though she had a little bit of a hint. I have to imagine, just from troubleshooting, she would have figured out to move to a different position to play from a different joystick. Dude, you've played Joust. If I told you to play on the left, you would flip me the bird. (laughs) No pun intended. (laughs) But seriously, you would tell me to fuck off. Like, I am no better on one side than the other when I play Joust. I, you know what though, it, it just happens to be that he got better. I, you know, I don't know. I'm not sure if it's a situation where the game was programmed for a particular perspective. Uh, and that's possible. Um, I think if you're terrible at Joust, it doesn't matter what side you're on. You're gonna you suck. Know, I think. I think I it's, it's that it's it's the awakening of competition. She saw, you know, she she was comfortable there, uh, you know, uh, in you know, with the copper key and the Lich King. She hadn't seen anybody in weeks, and she just kept going back night after night. The first time she saw somebody, she was fucking shocked because somebody else figured it out, right? Yeah. Maybe and it wouldn't matter what side she was a guy in. who's adept at video game playing, and all of a sudden he passes you up, that's got to piss you off. And, mm, sure. you know, I mean, it's it's sort of the same thing here, but in reverse for Wade, we're seeing it from Artemis' perspective, you know? Wade is like, I want to go win to prove myself to Artemis. Like, beating her is going to impress her at this point. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Especially when he's on his, uh, yeah... His his big ship filled with the Oasis and all the scientists and getting the heck out of Dodge. While well, she's like, "Well, can't save the planet." 
Right. You know, reflecting back onto the game, particularly with Joust, they have a region of interactivity that when that in- region of interactivity is interacted with, that it kicks off a piece of software, a function that then executes. And there might just be enough of a difference between a stork and an ostrich that one of the two birds has a slight advantage because it has less area to interact with. That would not be an unusual thing in gaming. But I like the, the you know, it just spurns competition bit. But uh, I, I just wonder. I'm, I'm going with that because it's sort of baked into the book at this point. <laughs> I mean, Wade, Wade, Wade talks about the fact that he's he wants to prove himself, so he just starts pulling up all of his shit to try and figure out, you know, now that he's narrowed it down to Sector 7, where is he going to find the Jade Key? Well, I like that he's changed his perspective from pining and being depressed to, fuck it, if I really want this, there's only one path to it, and now he's motivated to go through the egg in order to get to her. And, and I'm that's so going ex- to pull him through. Yeah, I'm so excited to get to chapter 22 because chapter 22, I feel like is, you know, if if you were to talk about a wrinkle in time in the book where the beginning <laughs> kind of starts to meet the end, I mean, chapter 22 is when you start to see Wade back in that pure form that he was in the beginning where he's only interested in the hunt. He's only interested in, you know, like the, the holiday lore kind of stuff. I mean, he really starts to feel it again. And there's a moment of inspiration that comes out of the second ch- or the 22nd chapter. We won't get into, but I, I, I will say that I think the 22nd chapter might be my favorite chapter of the entire book. But yeah, but he, he talks about how he's been pining over, and, you know, obsessing over the minutia of the quatrain at this point. It's four lines of text, 24 words, 34 syllables which adds up to 62. I don't know why I looked into that, but I did. I was really kind of grasping at straws of this chapter because there's not a lot in here. <laughs> you've got the artifacts, and then you've got him kind of going into and, and setting up for the travel, for him leaving and, and getting started. It's, it's yeah. the beginning of the next quest. It for really him. is. Yeah. And I love the fact that he's going to take uh, the Firefly, his heavily modified Firefly. Now, the part that I thought was a little odd was that he goes into how he obtained it, and he did it by using his X-Wing to basically beat the shit out of some peeps that thought they would pick on his ass. He blows out their engines, boards them, kills them one at a time, which to me is kind of like, now we're experiencing uh, Anakin Parzival. Yes. Did you, did you get that feeling like, well, I, I did, yeah, I, Revenge of the Sith, man, when he goes in and mows down all the kids. <laughs> <laughs> it, did it feel like that to you? Because it felt like I that did, to me. Yeah. Like, like the, the captain's like, oh, dude, I'm totally sorry. I'm a huge fan of yours. Fuck that. <laughs> it's in my notes, yeah. <laughs> I, said, I said, Wade goes Hayden Christensen. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 but he does. It, and you have to kick back and go, there's, there's no resetting. Like, he literally wiped out these people's digital lives just because they tried to steal his shit. Not he said he was, a, he was just in a mood that day. <laughs> I, I honestly want to hear more about how heavily modified the, uh, the ship is because the standard issue Firefly class ship has no defenses. I want to see like, oh, I want to see a war version of that ship. Fuck I'd love yeah. to see that with fucking missile racks on the side with torpedo bays in the in the cargo hangar. I mean, I'd love to see like a heavily modified warbird version complete with Vonnegut on the side and giant flaming painted streaks across the engines. That would be fucking awesome. Yeah, fuck yeah, that'd be so great. I don't think we're going to see that in the movie, but if we do, I, you, might need, it, to, you might need to hand me a of, towel. Like I, We've already got kind of an idea as how, how that looks from Serenity, where they put all of the dead bodies on the outside, and then they put the big yeah, gun on top. because they make like a reaver ship. But that's, that's more like of a facade than anything else. Right. But still, looks pretty fucking cool. Before, before we, we get to that point, uh, one of the things I want to bring up is he talks about his loadout. Um, he walks down to his armory and he pulls it up like a uh, paper doll 
Uh, for some reason, I have this noted, and this is just sort of like a fun aside. Do you remember those fucking things? It wasn't like a sticker, but it was like a like those things you put on the windows at Halloween or something like that. Those little like cling things, and you would put them on those like cardboard uh, cuneiforms. Cuneiforms, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it I reminded have, like, me of that for some reason. I had like monster cuneiforms where you could put like different arms and legs and shit. My, I think my I had, I, my I had sister had army cuneiforms. I had Ghostbuster ones where you'd have like a background and right. then you would take the thing and you would like set up the scene. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know I what I'm talking that. about? Those so like, that's what you're kind of thinking. It was just like a little cling. It wasn't a sticker, but it was sort of like this like rubbery piece of plastic. Vinyl. Yeah, vinyl. Yeah, it was vinyl. And then like, you know, in the shape of the character and you just like slap it on this background and you could like, you know, act out like whole scenes with it. But it reminded me of that. I don't know why. But um but yeah, I mean, like he's sitting there, he's he's modifying his loadout. One of the things he says is like, um, I always I always make sure to bring more than I need. I can't remember exactly how he says it, but uh He says he carries like three times the normal loadout for a gunter. Yeah. Just just so he has everything, just so that he doesn't like, oh darn, I left that thing behind. Yeah. Hold I on, can't tell you how many playthroughs in Skyrim I had needless cheese wheels on me. <laughs> like, <laughs> this is a common thing if you're a fucking, if you're a gamer, you're a fucking hoarder in the RPG world. <laughs> did you did you fucking say cheese wheels? Yeah, in Skyrim. God, using the restroom in Skyrim must have been difficult. Yeah, it probably was. But 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 no, like there there you Minus know of all the things you could pick up. Like for some reason, when when we had the house that we could keep it in, I just saved everything at a certain point i had like a medicine cabinet kind of thing that i kept that i kept off the side of the bedroom and it was just filled with potions that i would never use but at a certain point you have so much money you don't really need to sell them off but you just you know. go i don't want to run out of that <laughs> yeah but i'm not going to use that yeah i don't know I'm if i'm going to need that in the future i might so I'm just going to save it. And like, before you know it, I mean, you know, thank God for the fact that you can pretty much hide anything in an RPG because otherwise you'd look like a fucking hoarder. But it's, it's that same kind of thing. It's like when you go out on a journey, like if you think about a video game, everything that you pick up in a video game is for that last mission or for <laughs> the big missions on the way to like it. You get that and like, well, this would have been fucking helpful 20 yeah, minutes exactly. ago. <laughs> and then you end up not <laughs> using, you know, fucking 75 percent of it but you just see you load yourself down every time you go out like i'm strapped for fucking adventure and what happens here we'll find out next chapter but i'll give you a hint he doesn't need a fucking shotgun <laughs> <laughs> uh. but yeah uh, so so he's on the vonnegut now and one of the really interesting things that i was texting you guys about uh, tonight was that uh, the ship was originally owned, like Chris said, by the Overraptors, and it was originally called the Kaylee. I was striving to find a reference to the Kaylee because it seems like such an obscure thing. Like, why would you call it the Kaylee? Well, Kaylee well, was the name Kay of the engineer. Uh, the mechanic. The yeah. yeah, she was the she was she was the she was hot. She was a cute mechanic. Sure. She was like my favorite female character in that show. Period. Absolutely. She was great. That was the one you could totally relate to. And you were kind she of was the that. one who would be on this podcast. Yes, absolutely. Like if I was so, to invite anyone, it would probably be her. Okay. So we all agree that Kaylee's hot. Fine. <laughs> but the Overraptors, just by their name, we've talked about the Overraptors going way back. Names mean a lot of things to them. You know, I mean, it, you know, Overraptor is a very pointed term to the people who get the egg. Um, so I looked it up and Kaylee is actually an English version of, you know, the Irish Kayla or the Gaelic of, uh, you know, of Gaelic origin Kayla. And what it means is the keeper of keys. That's fucking awesome. Which I thought was really cool. That is fucking cool. Like if you could dual track your references like that. <laughs> It's that's, still pretty fucking cool. That's a double win. That's such a cool reference that that'd be just a great name to keep the ship. Okay, so I've got a couple others for you guys. Strap in. Now, I'm putting on my, uh, my Ready Player One tinfoil hat here because uh, you can just ignore everything I'm about to say, but I just thought it was kind of cool connections. 
So I looked up Keeper of the Keys after I found that reference. And one of the things that I found was uh, this was a position given to someone in the Game of Thrones universe. And uh, they were the Keeper of the Keys over the Seven Kingdoms. And we're in Sector 7. Oh, okay. And we know he's a fan of George R. R. Martin, so that's still kind of cool. Wait, so how do we know that? How do we know that? Atari? Game yeah. Over? I, I know. I'm fucking just, car to him. I, I'm, I'm opening the fucking door for you to, to answer that question. Oh. I, I, I know the answer, but yeah. It was a setup. <laughs> Atari? <laughs> Game over. Yeah, he's like, I don't know. He just happened to loan his fucking car to George R. Yeah, Martin. Yeah, he gave him his and, car. Of course, yeah, he's, he's a fan. He but showed it, them. It was just kind of cool. I mean, like you know, Seven Kingdoms, Sector Seven. It was kind of neat. It was a tieback. That's that's. Um, cool. But so, the other thing was there was a there was a movie that came out called The Keeper of Keys or just Keeper of Keys. Um, it was back in the nineteen seventies. Actually, it was a book before it was a movie. And I think the character's name was Charlie Chan. And it was sort of like a film noir mystery, kind of like uh, if you could imagine Raymond Chandler mixed with like Agatha Christie. And the thing was, the the main character's um, objective in that movie was to narrow down um, the murder of a suspect using a series of clues. Not the murder of a suspect, but but a murder that happened in the household using a series of clues. And I was like, well, that's sort of backhanded reference. It it doesn't really make sense, but just just cool things I found out while I was researching the keeper of keys thing. <laughs> but still, I mean, even going back to, you know, its basis level, the uh the Kaylee meaning keeper of keys thing is pretty fucking that's, cool. That's pretty that fucking that awesome. Is, that is a, that was a good deep dive onto that. I would have just stopped at at the engineer for yeah, Firefly, that's where I stopped. But the fact that the name actually moves even further into the story is just kind of it almost makes Kaylee feel like a like a false front that yeah. you would have put up, and that there's a deeper, deeper place like that false room where you think a Serac is, but that's the false a Serac. You gotta go further. And it's also just like like what uh what you guys were unpacking about Falco in the last mm. chapter. Mm. We're starting to unpack about Falco. You probably oh, never yeah. uh, but Aaron I never got, that I, he had I never had got to my Falco reference there, actually. So since we're talking about it now, I could get into it. It won't take that long. Sure. That's, right. that's yeah. yeah, that's the setup. Yeah. So last <laughs> chapter. Yeah. So last chapter we were talking about Falco, or the fact that he's got this new base on Falco. And I had this whole thing about, um, you know, because Falco was the Austrian rap star. And I looked it up and he's, you know, like his, uh, his greatest hit is Rock Me Amadeus. So the lyrics to Rock Me Amadeus translated into English are as follows, or at least here's part of it. He was the first punk ever to set foot on this earth. He was a genius from the day of his birth. He could play the piano like the like a ring and a bell, and everyone screamed, come on, rock me Amadeus. With a bottle of wine in one hand and a woman in the other, his mind was on rock and roll and having fun. Because he lived so fast, he had to die so young, but he made his mark in history. Still, everybody says, rock me Amadeus. Who comes to mind hearing that? I think Parzival. Totally. I can see that. Like, There's at least that jump where you've got this young person who's a genius and just freaking prodigy at what they do. As far as alcohol and women on his arms are concerned. Yeah, not directly. Screw, but it, at the very least, though, when he is in the Oasis, he's like a pop star. He is like a godlike rock star. With, If he wanted to have any number of female or anything in between, really, alien what not avatars uh, on his arms he could totally have his choice it, any number of avatars that look like females but are really dudes named chuck uh, dude named in their chuck, mother's yeah, basement he chuck. could have any number of chucks on his arm in the oasis and, and from that perspective i could totally see how this relates very directly to him see i saw it as relating to halliday uh, because of the line that says, because he lived so fast, he had to die so young, and, but he made his mark on history, but still everybody says, rock me on the days. It's kind of like, 
you know, he, he died, but he made his mark in history and people are still, you know, they're yeah, so when engrossed you first, in the when Oasis. You first sent that to me through text message. That was kind of the feeling that I got to. Uh, weird. I didn't get that at all. That, well, I, mean, like, I, it, I mean, if you look at like, you know, the, the, the prodigy of the story, it's definitely Halliday. You know what I mean? Like Wade is sort of the, 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 the person who comes in and like, you know, figures out the maze that was laid out by this genius. Yeah, so, I can see that. you know, I mean, to a certain degree, I mean, Halliday is sort of the Amadeus of the story. I, I guess, but Amad, but Halliday is nothing like Amadeus in the sense that he wasn't with, you know, female in one arm, drinking in the other, and incredibly audacious. No, it doesn't have to be that explicit. Right. Uh, well, I guess that's the reason why I was kind of like thinking Parzival, because Parzival at the moment is just so crazy popular. But fuck, you know, so is, uh, so is Halliday, too. So I don't I, see I totally any women on his arms. <laughs> I, I totally see why you went that way. That's not where my head went, but I, I can totally see that. But, you know, regardless of whether or not he has a woman on his arm, he has a fucking fury of people hanging out outside of Falco. Um, a paparazzi culture of people. It's, um, it's bounty hunters. It's fans. It's, you know... Uh, revelers, it's people who want to follow him to his it's next destination. People with too much time on their people, yeah. <sighs> there seems to be an abundance of that in the oasis. <laughs> and and herein lies another potential gruff that I've got, not per se with the story, but that you've got individuals that are hanging out there. It's it's obviously known at this point that people know where he is. And if you could ask yourself what IOI is capable of doing, I'd say that IOI is at least capable of keeping any number of people active on the threads that are whispering around the locations of specific individuals. That while they might not be able to go to his asteroid, that IOI hadn't A, figured it out where he was because evidently other people have, and then parked a shitload of battleships outside of his asteroid to keep him locked up in that little rock is kind of... I thought it interesting. Uh, I, it, it's as if this was like something that was thrown out there that was neither functional moving forward, but could even create a plot hole in the moment. That was kind of like, well, man. Okay, so now this brings up an interesting point. Like in the game Ark, uh, which is a fairly new game, um, when you load into the server, the place where you load in is the last place where you despawned or where you fell over. When, you know, in the Oasis, you know, do, do you do you pop up and you can choose where in the map that you spawn or do you spawn in the last place that you logged out? I think you, he mentions it earlier in the book. You mean if you die? No. Oh, like if I log out, like I say, good night, Chris, log out. When I log back in, is it the place that I said, good night, Chris, or do I have like a fucking world map that I can say? Okay. I think I think they say it's where you logged out from. I think I mean, so I, too, because you know, otherwise imagine, he would have been all over the oasis. I was about to say because otherwise you would use that as a loophole for traveling without paying for it. Sure. And they they seem to have nailed down that market. Yeah, but it, but but then again, think about how fast travel works in 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 video games. You can only fast travel to places where you've already been. Well, that's great, but that's not how travel's described in this book, as far as the oasis is concerned. No, I know that, you... but oh, okay. but but if he were to spawn in, he would have to spawn into a place that he had already been. So I'm saying, if if and after that's fast, he's that's how fast travel works. Is you've been there, you have access to it. Right, exactly. Yeah, so when he logs in, is he given like a map of places that he can log in that he's already been to? I don't know. Uh, it doesn't really nail it down, and they've got so much about the cost of travel. Uh, and that it takes time to travel and that or, you know, or going through a gate. It, I, I would think that. It, that if you've been there just because you had been there doesn't mean you have spun because there aren't really gates per se. Then there are like the door that you walk through on the planet of Ludus to go to a different school. Mm -hmm. uh, but even that cost. Right. So just because you had gone through the gate at Ludus to go to another school on Ludus, you've still got to pay to go to that other school. And that's the reason why they're vouchers. So I, 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 I don't suspect it works like that. 
I'm I'm pretty sure this is answered in chapter three. I was just bringing it up because okay. we're almost to the end of the chapter and there's not much to extrapolate. But I'm pretty sure in like chapter three or four, he says that you spawn back in in the place that you left. Yeah, and that would make sense. Yeah, I think. Otherwise, you would use it as a means of escape, but also that you can't just turn off your computer or or turn off the game. That if you're in danger, your character lingers around in the place that you were long enough to die if you try to use it as an escape. Well, that's like Ark does that too. Like if if I log out of Ark, um, and 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 my body is just like laying in the middle of a field, if somebody comes up. And sees it like my body will still be laying there in that server, and they can yeah. hack me up and take all my inventory. <laughs> Same is true so, with Eve. Yeah, you get into a bad space, you can't just log out. Your shit will stay there for like a good minute or two, and you'll get trashed. Yeah, with Ark, it's still it's until you log back in. <laughs> like you, your shit will stay there on the server until you log back in. I stopped playing in. Uh, I, I started playing Ark with my Destiny clan, and um, I, <laughs> I I stopped playing, and they just left my body in the corner of this stronghold that they built. <laughs> so, and it was still did, waiting for me in that server. <laughs> did you just like say I'm going to go sleep by this tree, and I'll be back on tomorrow? And you just wake up and you stand up by the tree. Like that was it was literally... more like I'm fucking done with this. And I think we had a boat at the time, <laughs> like, and I was on the boat. <laughs> But somehow they had, like, preserved my body in this space. <laughs> when I got back on, it was just like, it was, it was thank God yeah. for those guys. <laughs> 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 but anyways, uh, yeah, so so however you spawn back in, uh, Wade's getting followed all over the place, and we know exactly how he is getting to Arcade. He is going through a Stargate, which is normally reserved for corporate travel and shit like that because it's so expensive. But this is pretty important. Um, if you've never played Mass Effect before, the way that he describes these Stargates is a lot like Mass Effect. And it's also a lot like Stargates because obviously that's what he called it. It reminds me a lot of like Eve's Stargates as well. It's, that's yeah. the picture that came to my mind. It's just a means yeah. to star warp to a far off place. Yeah. <clears throat> it's somewhere between like a wormhole and a hyperdrive. <laughs> But yeah, um, <laughs> so that is, uh, if we sound unriveted, it's because <laughs> chapter 21 is sort of a, uh, <laughs> it's, I, I would call this a utilitarian chapter, wouldn't you? <laughs> it's I, a transition. I want fan art of the Vonnegut. Yes, please. I'd love to see fan art For of the love Vonnegut. of, just, I mean, the ship exists, it's, it's a, it's a tabula rosa for your artistic capabilities. I want to see like manufacturers fan art like 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 please a, like don't a f- just send us screenshots of firefly <laughs> <laughs> look it's got bodies yeah, yeah. done <laughs> i want to know what a what a kick i want to see how the company that made firefly would sell a heavily modified firefly like i want to see fucking poster art for that shit so post awesome. it up on uh, Facebook or Twitter or Reddit or wherever you go. We'd love to see it. That would be fucking awesome. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, so so right now in uh, the Get to the Good Part universe, it is March. Is it 11? Yeah. Uh, 12. 11. Yes. It's the 11th. Uh, so as we speak... Um, they're, the world premiere of Ready Player One is happening. Um, it's only, guys, it's like two short weeks away until we see the movie. Oh my god. I, Finally. I can't remember the last time I was this excited to see a movie. Probably The I, Dark Knight, but... I can't remember the last time I spent so much money revolving around a single movie. <laughs> yep. And by the way, I, I will admit this, and Angie, if you're listening, um, I, I, I'm i going to fully admit this right now. When I was talking to Angie in the Columbus thing, I told her, you know, I'm going to wait until after the movie passes, see how it does, go to GameStop and Hot Topic and just buy all that shit on clearance. 
That didn't happen, did it? Angie, I was a liar. Um, <laughs> I have I have like over a hundred dollars worth of hot topic shit <laughs> that's gonna be arriving in my house tomorrow night. I even got the water bottle, Chris. I got the fucking water <laughs> bottle. The Gregorius yeah. Games aluminum water bottle. I got that. I actually I ordered my daughter the uh, Artemis eyeshadow. I got the Gregarious Games T-shirt. I got one of the blind bags for the keys. I got the Crystal Parzival because that's like a special edition kind of thing. I got the Gregarious Games water uh, aluminum like water thing, and I got the uh, the Iron Giant um, blueprint T-shirt. Oh, yeah, that cool. that looks cool. And I thought I got more. Oh yeah, and I got the uh, four set of. Uh, Parzival, Artemis, H, and uh, Irock. And Irock. Oh, the little action figures? Yeah. You already have that, but... I don't have that. Oh, you didn't? Mm-mm. No, it's... I, I'm not... I, I'm not... Like, as a kid, I would have preferred that over the Funko Pop shit. Like, for me, the Funko Pop oh, shit's sure. like... I set it up. It's nice decoration. It has no functionality. But I'm not into playing... I, I just... I'm not gonna... I saw that. It was like, that looks kind of cool. But, again, I was being kind of selective and i figured at the very least i would get the high five but i'll tell you what though here's something that struck me when we were in columbus and he was doing the stand-up presentation and he said before he came out to us he was playing with his toys the night before and he showed us pictures yeah of the it looked like a two and a half foot tall iron giant yeah and i saw that and i was like when the fuck is that coming out like, there's got to be more action figures. And, to- like, maybe they'll have a, a DeLorean and oh, an Iron Christ, Giant. If they if they bring that out. Oh, my God. I don't care what it costs. Yeah, if they have a uh, Parzival DeLorean with the Ghostbusters on the Gullwing doors and all that shit, I'm buying that shit. And I hope they come up with a Lego version, too. Well, they, there they, is... be, they better they better sell it with a fucking glass case because if not, I'm gonna buy one and I'm not gonna feel bad about it. No. <laughs> well, the, and here's the thing: as I was looking, I was like, hey, I've got the the, the Funko Pop Parzival, but there isn't a DeLorean out there specific to this. But there is a DeLorean out there for Funko Pop uh, Back to the Future. It's fifty dollars on really? eBay, or not eBay, but on a- Amazon. Okay. And I was like, fuck it, I could get that and I can change it. 50 is not I can, bad. I can make that look like Parzival's uh, DeLorean. We'll see how the movie does. Anyways, so this is what a conversation looks like before we hit record in the podcast. <laughs> 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 and it's probably what it's going to sound like after we log off. But uh, at any rate, um, you should hear from us one more time after this before the movie comes out. I would hope. Um, if not, fuck, I hope it's good. Um, after the movie comes out, Chris and I are going to see it open opening night. Um, Aaron is too. Uh, if it's not good, you may never hear from us again. Yeah, we're gonna party. <laughs> we're gonna be party so fucking that deflated. Night. You um, might have to talk us off the cliff though. Expect more shitty periscopes from me, uh, from the movie line and from uh, the after party thing. Um, like I said, guys, uh, everybody who is a Columbus, and for the people who weren't, it's just so cool to be a part of this community. I've never been this excited as a grown man. I mean, to have that Christmas feeling about a movie is just, it's a fucking, it's a gift. I mean, it's fucking amazing. And it's so cool to be a part of this community. It's so cool to be a part of this community right now, right before the movie comes out. And I'm excited along with you guys. And I hope you're just as excited as we are. Fuck. Yeah. If anything, this book has been like a beacon of commonality. Yeah. It's as if somebody holds this up, you instantly know that you've got a million different connections with that person that you can chat with immediately. Yeah. It's not so much being a fan of the book. It's that the book is a beacon for commonality amongst people who are fans of that culture. Yeah. I said it on Twitter and I'll close with this. Uh, When you set up a, uh, or when a group of fans comes together and they end up being a group of friends, that's a community. And that's exactly what's been built around this book. And Ernest Klein, damn good job for bringing this this particular community together because as far as my interactions are concerned, I love every one of them. Um, 
But yeah, so sentimental shit aside, this has been and always will be get to the good part. I am Ryan. This is Chris. And I'm Aaron. See ya next time. So long. Hey, Chris. Yo. Did you have to close out the episode saying that I cut in front of two ladies? <laughs> well, uh, because I started a podcast. Uh, I didn't mean to put it the way, that way. I didn't think I put it that way. I'm going to have to re-listen to it. But it, it re-listen just was that they, they let you... Cut in front of them. They allowed that to happen. That was on them. So we could you stand didn't... together, not because I started a podcast. <laughs> no, the, the gist was that we wanted you to come forward with us so you could go ahead of us because we did the podcast, because you kicked it off. That's, That's how I put it. You took that weird. So to be fair, I didn't hear it the same way you did, Ryan. I thought it was kind of the way Chris intended. Now I'll listen to it again. Now that your ears have been be molested able, uh, by his yeah. uh, by his sensitivities, wait, very wait. Se- a very sensitive message <laughs> wise right now. Because <laughs> my job is literally to just pick out the things that are offending the company. <laughs> that does not sound like a very fun job but, right now. <laughs> but no, like when I listened to it, I was just like, "God, I sound like an asshole." No, and I felt like really bad because I was like, like I, I like I immediately went back and I was like. I remembered that moment when we did the cut and I was like, and she was like, no. And I was like, oh, uh, and she was like, no, nah, I'm just kidding. And I was like, was she really kidding? I don't know if she was really kidding. No, sure. I just, you know, I just thought it was really cool that she kind of let you come ahead. We I wanted, thought so too. We wanted you to be ahead of us because I wanted to see you interact with Ernest Klein. Like, was like fucking, myself? Fuck, well, we <laughs> all fucking did. did. <laughs> Didn't we all fucking embarrass ourselves? Really? I mean, Ernest Klein's a graceful guy, so he just kind of took that stride. Every one of us kind of embarrassed ourselves. But it's just going to happen. The only thing that I could say was, I'm Ryan. Here's the thing, Ryan, is, is you're an incredibly humble guy. So whenever anybody gives you any sort of grace, and it's incredibly endearing, you just didn't want to offend them, dude. But we all pretty much made fools of ourselves. So we just thought we'd see you do it first and admire that. If it had just been me, though... He would not have known that the podcast was there. (laughs) Because all I literally said was, I'm Ryan. That was it. That was all I could get out. Now, Aaron, I'm I'm curious. Did you mention the podcast at all? Or did you just fucking look up and go, I know that? If you want, I can play the recording of him realizing that I was from the podcast. You have one? (laughs) That would be awesome. It's like, oh, you're from that podcast. (laughs) Well, okay, okay. Let's just fucking start the show. Fart the fucking start the show. <laughs> All right, yeah, let's let's do a really muddy segue into the show. Welcome to get to the good part, folks. My name is Ryan. This is Chris. And I'm Aaron.